following presentation is from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland. And our scripture today comes from 2 Kings chapter 22, verses 11 through 20. And on this uh, All Saints Sunday, we continue the series that we have been in the past couple months uh, of hidden figures, looking at some of the lesser known characters of the Bible. And today we come to a character named Holda the Prophet. Holda the Prophet. 2 Kings chapter 22. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded the priest Hilkiah, Iakim son of Shaphan, Agbor son of Micaiah, Shephon the secretary and the king's servant Azaiah, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our ancestors did not obey the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So the priest Hilkiah, Achaikim, Agbor, Shaphon, and Aziah went to the prophetess Huldah, the wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, son of Herhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She resided in Jerusalem in the second quarter where they consulted her. She declared to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, I will indeed bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants. All the words of the book that the king of Judah has read, because they have abandoned me and made offerings to other gods so that they have provoked me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore my wrath will be kindled against this place and it will not be quenched. But as to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse. And because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Therefore I will gather you to your ancestors, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring on this place. They took the message back to the king. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that as we explore it together, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would change our lives, that you would help us to be the disciples, the men and women that you're calling us to be. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. So our story begins in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city of David. Jerusalem, the city where the temple of the true and living God was located. But at this point, the glory days of Jerusalem are long gone. The glory days of David are in the distant past. Faith in God has been reduced to public rituals, and the land is blighted with altars, altars to pagan gods. We're introduced to King Josiah. He came to the throne at that tender young age of eight, after his father had been assassinated. His father and grandfather had reigns that were characterized by idolatry, desecration, violence, and bloodshed. But somehow, and amazingly, with uh, grandparents and parents like that, Josiah, the Bible tells us, did what was right in the sight of the Lord. In the 18th year of his reign, Josiah began a temple renovation project. He wanted to restore that holy place, that place that had been neglected for so long. And during the renovation work on the temple, the high priest is there overseeing the work when all of a sudden someone discovers a book of the law, the book of the law. Most scholars think that this was the book of Deuteronomy. Evidently, it had been shoved into a dark corner and it had been hidden away under previous king's regimes. And the high priest and the king's secretary, they go to Josiah. And they inform the king of what they found. And then they read the words of that book aloud to him. And when Josiah hears the contents of that document, he is greatly distressed. He's distressed and he tears his clothes because he has realized how unfaithful the people had been. They had not followed God's law. And it's in this state that Josiah orders five high-ranking religious political leaders to undertake a specific task. He's distressed, 
And so he dispatches this delegation to go inquire of the Lord on behalf of the king and all the people. You see, Josiah recognizes that the disobedience of his ancestors had kindled God's anger and that the consequences would be far-reaching. Now, Josiah doesn't specify what prophet the delegation could consult. They could have went to see Jeremiah. He was prophesying at this time. They could have went to see Zephaniah, who was another prophet that was working around Jerusalem in those days. Both of them were men who were prophesying. But they don't go to Jeremiah, and they don't go to Zephaniah. They go straight to the second quarter of Jerusalem. It's a residential area of the city, and they go to the home of a woman named Hulda. Hulda. There was no debate about where they should go. It seems that they knew They knew that the king wanted them to consult Hulda. And we don't get a lot of details about Hulda. We're actually told a lot more about her husband than we are about her. We're given her husband's name, it's Shalom. We're given the name of his father and his grandfather. And we're also told his job. He was the keeper of the wardrobe. Sounds like an exciting job. He was uh, maybe responsible for the king's robes and clothes for all occasions. But anyway, this delegation of cabinet members come and and they arrive at Hulda's home here in this residential neighborhood of Jerusalem and they knock on the door. Hulda opens it and she sees this entourage standing before her. One of them has a weathered scroll under his arm. The dusty, tattered look of that scroll reeks of something mysterious and she listens to what the men tell her but she's anxious to unroll that scroll and to see what it might reveal. And when she opens it, she is amazed to find the book of Deuteronomy. She reviews it, and then she is ready to prophesy. Now, Holda's name means weasel. That's right, weasel. I, I don't know why, uh, why they named her weasel, and that may, might be why we don't name anyone Holda today. But while Holda's name means weasel, her response to the king's inquiry has no hint of weasel wording. Her tone is authoritative. She has four, thus says the Lord. She verifies that this is in fact the true book of the law. And she confirms Josiah's fears. The words that he heard from this book will happen, Hulda says. She pronounces judgment upon Jerusalem and its inhabitants because they've been disloyal to God and have served idols. The the anger of the Lord will be kindled against Jerusalem and its inhabitants. Hulda says, and his anger will not be quenched. But as for the king, as for Josiah, because he had heard God, God also heard him. And Hulda prophesies that Josiah will be gathered to the grave with his ancestors, that he will be buried in peace. Hulda says that Josiah's eyes will not see the disaster that God will bring upon Jerusalem. And in fact, Hulda's prophecy comes true, and Josiah dies before the devastation in Jerusalem. But Hulda, throughout this whole word, is not intimidated. Hulda is not afraid. She has been entrusted with a message from the Lord for Josiah, and she does not fail to deliver it. She wasn't someone who we would expect to have the king's officials knocking on their door. We wouldn't expect that they would be soliciting her judgment. Yet when they came, she was ready She had been communing with God, and she was ready to speak when she was asked. And it could not have been easy. It certainly took bravery and courage to deliver such words of doom. In fact, one commentator calls her the prophetess of doom. She freely shared. She freely shared what God revealed to her, no matter the consequences. Well, the five officials take hold of his message back to the king, and Josiah treats her prophecy with utmost seriousness. He gathers the people at the temple, and then he reads them. He reads aloud the words of the book, and there among the throngs of people, he makes a covenant before God that he will follow all of God's decrees and all of God's laws, and the people join in the covenant. Josiah continues to reform. He he cleanses the temple. He removes and destroys all the pagan artifacts and altars and images. He deposes false priests, And he eradicates the high places where offerings had been made to other gods, including the altars 
that were used for child sacrifice. And then finally, in a great act of reform, he reinstates the Passover, which had been neglected for hundreds of years. He leads the people to remember that the Lord was the God who brought them out of Egypt, and they gave thanks for God and for God's faithfulness. You see, the words of the prophet Huldah initiated this wholesale reformation. Her prophecy serves as a catalyst for major change. Oh, Huldah is a significant figure, even though we only have this brief, brief snapshot of her ministry. One scholar ends an essay on Huldah's story with this question. Why do you think there are so few sermons on Huldah in churches today? Well, why do you think we only have seven verses on the lady? Maybe it's because of that. But Hoda is a source of encouragement to all of us. After giving her oracle to Josiah's entourage, Hoda dis- disappears from the pages of Scripture. She proclaimed her oracle, and nothing else is written about her. Unlike the prophets who lived roughly around the same time as Hulda, we also already talked about Jeremiah and Zephaniah. We also had Isaiah that was a contemporary, Nahum and Habakkuk. All of their oracles, all the oracles of these men were collected and canonized. But there is no book, no book named in Hulda's honor. To those who feel insignificant, to those who feel pushed to the sidelines, Holder reminds us that you don't need a book about you to be used by God. You don't need, need your name on a book to be used by God. God worked through this woman. God worked through this prophet. And Josiah and all of his kingdom were impacted. Holder did not seek notoriety, but her role in this story was remembered for generations. The author of Kings makes certain that her faithfulness was recorded. Holder's status in the eyes of society didn't determine her faithfulness to God's message. She was a woman in a patriarchal world. She was on the margins of society. But her faithfulness and her fruitfulness came even if she was on the margins. She was able to enact change in Israel, even from that place in the shadows. On the day of Pentecost, Peter said that God was pouring out his spirit on all flesh, that both men and women... Sons and daughters would prophesy. But even before the day of Pentecost, God inspired both men and women to prophesy. You know, God is in the business of using us, no matter our gender, no matter our background, no matter our social status, no matter who we are, God can use us to impact the lives of others. And I've been enjoying this series of messages on the hidden figures of the Bible because I've been delving into stories that I wouldn't have explored otherwise. Some of these people I had just read over. But sprinkled throughout the Bible, there are verses here and there, like these verses on Hulda, that point to this numerous cast of supporting characters. These supporting characters in this great multi-generational drama of God's work in the world. And today we come together. We come on All Saints Sunday to remember all the saints... Not just the ones whose names we all know, but the ordinary people who love and serve God. Saints still living on earth and those resting in God's presence. A pastor was giving a children's sermon. It was a sanctuary with beautiful stained glass windows. And on those stained glass windows, it pictured uh, several of the saints in church history. The pastor was pointing out who each one was and, and the things that they were known for. And then he turned around and asked the kids, so kids, what is a saint? And one little girl answered, a saint is someone the light shines through. A saint is someone the light shines through. And that's exactly it. A saint is a person through whom the light of God shines. Everyday men and women, men and women like Holda, who let God's light shine through them, who let God's word speak through them, that's what a saint is. And so I encourage you on this day, think about the people who have shaped your journey of faith. We stand on the shoulders of everyday saints, saints that made a difference in our lives. Who are the people who nurtured your faith? Who are the people who heard your questions and supported you in your doubts? Who are the people who prayed for you? Who are the people who encouraged you? Who are the people who invested in your life? Who are your saints? Like Hulda Your saints may never have a book written about them, but they make a difference. They made a difference. They inspired you. They encouraged you. They became a catalyst for change in your life. None of us come to this faith on our own. 
We were all invited, supported, guided, counseled, challenged, and discipled. Discipled by scores of regular people, men and women who were doing their best to follow Jesus. I know in my own life, I've needed lots, lots of these kind of saints. And I encourage you today, take some time to tell the story of one of your saints. Maybe it will be over lunch. Maybe it'll be in a phone call to a friend or even on a Facebook post. Whatever you can do. All Saints Day gives us an opportunity to honor the journey and to tell the stories of those who have lived the faith, those who have influenced our own discipleship. Everyday saints are men and women who put into practice the love of Jesus. They are people of hope who radiate God's love. And so today, let us remember these lives of everyday saints, saints known and unknown, men and women, and let us remember their faithful witness. Let us celebrate and give God thanks. Give God thanks for his grace that placed him in our lives. And let us commit today to be inspired by their example and to let God's love radiate out of our lives just as it did out of theirs. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for this story, this short story of Halda the prophetess. And we're reminded, Lord, of how you use sometimes these little known supporting characters in the Bible to support your ongoing work in the world. And we're reminded today of how you use others in our lives, saints who encouraged us and inspired us, some of whom uh, the world did not take note. They didn't know their names, but you know their names, Lord. And we know their names because they have inspired us in our faith journey. And we thank you for their example. We thank you for how they witness to your love. We thank you for how they radiate your love into this world. And I pray, Lord, today that as we reflect on those who inspired us in our faith, that we would now take the baton from them and we would be encouraged by their example to invest in others. Show us, Lord, the places and the people in whose lives we might radiate your love. Show us those that we can encourage and those that we can invest in and those that we can pray for. Show us, Lord, so that we might be your vessels, used for your honor and your glory, your saints. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We read the story of honor and glory and praise the name of Christ. The preceding presentation came from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland.